Well, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here this afternoon. I'm delighted, especially as the Global Greens Ambassador, uh, to say what a great candidate for the Green Party Jill Stein is uh, in the uh, upcoming election in the United States. But I've been coming to these COPs since COP4 in Buenos Aires. So it's taken a long time. And the question was put today, is China the game changer here at the negotiations? Well, I would argue, as Director Son just said, that it's actually the natural world that is the game changer. It has gone from theory to actual reality. People are now living the impacts of global warming. And as Jill Stein said, people are dying from global warming and especially in the part of the world that I come from, uh, in the uh, Pacific region, we are seeing people who are dying as a result of extreme weather events and that's happening across the planet. And it's appropriate that we're here today with the red alert in China. The World Health Organization says 25 uh, micrograms is uh, considered unsafe. The level in Beijing at the moment is 256. That's why they've closed, the they've closed down the schools and businesses in order uh, to try to keep people as safe as they can. So it is the natural world that is teaching people what we've known for a long time. There are actually only two real things in the world, people and nature. And economic systems were developed to be the tool that govern the relationship between people and nature. But the economic tools that we are using have led to unsustainable relationships. That has led to the over-exploitation of the Earth's resources. It has led to conflict. It has led to the destruction of human rights. And we have to change it. So the opportunity we now have is to change the economic system so that it rebalances the relationship between people and nature so that it's a sustainable relationship into the longer term. And that's why I'm very pleased to be here in the context of China's uh, policy of towards ecological civilization, because it's the first time that you have had such a major nation in the world standing up and saying that GDP is not the only measurement of well-being that GDP, actually, actually every extreme weather event increases GDP, as it turns out. That's how stupid it is. So we need to have a different economic measurement tool. And the fact that the Chinese are now moving to redefine economics, to redefine what GDP, what, well, how you might calculate well-being and growth, that is a really important contribution. Having said that, I'd like to welcome some things about the shift in China's policy. Uh, particularly, first of all, it is actually giving the world an opportunity to constrain global warming to less than two degrees, because what we are seeing with the drop in coal use, 2.9% uh, on 2013 levels, it has given us the chance of two degrees, but not 1.5, which is necessary. And the Greens are here at this conference to say in every delegation in which we are represented that 1.5 is what we should be aiming for, not two degrees. Secondly, I really welcome the fact that China is rebalancing its economy. It has, it's moving away from such a heavy dependence on high polluting industries into more service, more sophisticated uh, industries, and that has allowed the pollution uh, levels to drop. That is really important uh, in terms of uh, the global perspective. Iron and steel is reducing its output, therefore reducing its emission levels. In the Australian context, I can tell you that the fact that China went into mass production of solar PV, photovoltaics, has meant that it brought it down the cost curve so much that there is now very high levels of solar photovoltaic, rooftop photovoltaic penetration in Australia only made possible because China brought it down the cost curve with mass production. And that will be exactly the same 
with a whole range of technologies in energy efficiency, in building construction materials, in a whole range of things. And part of this plan that China has is relates to greening cities, buildings uh, and the like. Really important on high-speed rail, transport systems and so on. Again, China used the opportunity of the global financial crisis to bring forward its construction of high-speed rail. And that, again, will be another uh, important contribution. But the challenge for China, and this is where the global greens come in, is how to make the air breathable in China, how to have enough water for China to drink and to use in terms of its uh, production of food and how to have its energy system because energy systems are water dependent and it is going to be the water crisis that helps accelerate China getting out of coal. It's going to be the water crisis that makes nuclear unacceptable in large parts of China because especially inland China, where you have that water being discharged into internal rivers. But the water crisis is such that the coal areas of China and the food areas of China tend to be in the same place in the north. There is a massive competition for water between resource development and food production. And the concern the, Green has, the Greens have is that China will seek social and political stability by shifting its energy system more to renewables and efficiency, which is great, but will outsource food production to the rest of the world. That has real social justice implications. You may have heard the term of land grabbing, and it's certainly not just China buying agricultural land and water around the world. Many other countries are doing it as well. The Saudis, the Qataris, there are a whole lot. The issue here is that the transfer of technology, the going out and buying agricultural land and water has to have local benefits. It must not just lead to the displacement of people in those countries. This is a very strong social justice perspective that the Greens bring from Africa, from Indonesia. We've seen it with Red Plus, where countries go in and they say, Yes, we'll do this deal on these forests, but local people are then deliberately pushed out of their forests and off their land, and there is no benefit to them. And there has been a failure to recognise by so many people that access to land is about identity and culture as well as it is about living day to day. And this is something that is lost in these negotiations when you start talking about technology transfer. It is also about nature. It is also about culture and it is about heritage. Now that is embedded in the Chinese program and it may well be delivered in China. But the challenge for China, the challenge for the United States, the challenge for all developed countries is that what they want for themselves, they must be prepared to facilitate for the people in whose countries they decide to operate. And as a final note on climate finance, one of the greatest fears I have from the Green Party and from people watching these negotiations, we've seen it with overseas aid, where countries have used overseas aid as a mechanism for what I describe as corporate welfare, to use overseas aid funding to prop up businesses based in those countries in order to do business overseas. There is a real risk with the Green Climate Fund that countries will say, yes, we'll put in so many billion dollars, but that must support German projects or Japanese projects or American projects or Australian projects or whatever it might be, and Australian technology, Australian everything, and the local people will not be consulted about the project, will have no ownership, no capacity. We have to make sure climate finance is just. <laughs> Issue of palm oil is another one, just as a straight up example, where palm oil use has massively exploded. China is one of the places using more, but other places as well. That has led to massive tropical deforestation. So there are consequences 
of changing lifestyles in China, consequences of the shifts that are necessary, both not only in China, all over the world. And let me say that I am one of the biggest critics of Australia in these talks. We are 59 out of 61 in terms of being at the bottom, so please do not assume I am defending Australia's position in this. But it is really important that as we come into these talks, we bring a social justice perspective because you cannot have an ecological civilization unless it is ecologically focused and long term, socially just, make sure it supports peace and non-violence, and finally is participatory. You must have participation, maximise participation from local people in the decisions that are going to affect the lives of local people. So I really um, <laughs> congratulate China on this shift in its uh, thinking, but I would urge China to also recognise that human rights and social justice are going to be one of the lens or a lens through which the rest of the world also views the policy shifts in China, in the United States, and we had it this week with President Obama, with the Pacific Island countries asking for loss and damage, and President Obama comes along and says 30 million, 30 million, which is the equivalent of 30 pieces of silver, 30 million for insurance. And who will that benefit? That is corporate welfare for the insurance sector already being done over because they can't pay after extreme weather events. It's 30 million into their pockets and it leaves the Pacific Islanders with nothing. That is not the way we need to proceed in these talks. So I really want to thank the participants here. I want to thank um, Director Sun for his um, coming here. But just to remind everyone that ultimately, you can strip away everything else and all we've got is people and the planet on which we live. And the water crisis is going to be as much a determinant of how China responds and maintains political stability, water, air, clean air, clean water, uncontaminated soil. Without them, we can't survive on the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. That was just very, very to the point. And uh, now I'd like to invite a panel which will include Sarah Ticola of Got Green from Seattle, Washington, Freddie Lane of the Lumi, Lumi Nation, Indigenous Native Americans, Deborah Parker of the Tulayap Tribe, also Indigenous Americans. Uh, Peter, are you also joining the panel? Yes, come up with us, okay? And I'd like to ask Jill Stein, since Washington State is a very powerful green state, to join the panel as well with us, okay? Okay, thank you, that's great. Now, um, very interesting, we're talking about China because when President Xi Jinping visited America recently, his first stop was to Seattle, Washington. Most people don't know that the largest trading partner in the United States of any state is in fact Washington State. It is also a state that has very powerful roots within the uh, indigenous people. Uh, many of whom have lost their lands, but also who are holding on to their traditions and beliefs from which we have a lot of solutions on the environment. So I'm actually going to ask, starting with Sarah, uh, each of you to introduce yourself and your position, a few thoughts on today's talk, and we'll just, each of you will do an intervention, and then I'm going to ask Jill to say a few words in summary. Uh, and we'll be closing with our last speaker today. I don't want anyone to leave this room because our last speaker is C Celine Costo, the granddaughter of the legend Jacques Costo, who is carrying that legend into the future. So she's going to be closing today. But first, I'd like to ask each of you to present your thoughts on what you've heard today 
and where it's going to go in the future. Okay, thank you. Let's start with Sarah. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me here today. So I work with uh, Got Green, and they're an environmental justice group um, from Seattle, Washington, and we make sure that the green economy works for everyone because right now um, all of the rebuilding of um, green, uh, not only in the green economy, but um, when we recreate these cities, when we redevelop them, they're actually pushing out um, the most vulnerable communities. And so we're trying to make sure that everyone has access to this. Um, we also are fighting for a just policy. Right now they're trying to put cap and trade um, in Washington State, and we reject that because carbon markets are not the solution. Um, and uh, carbon, you know, really, it's it's that same mentality and the mentality um, that we can solve this through capitalism when capitalism is really the problem that got us here in the first place. We're going to have to really look for a new system that does not put profit over people. I look for a sustainable system where we're not measuring um, our progress through uh, consumption, which is wha where we're at right now. Um, I'm also an Ethiopian American, and uh, I all work on a lot of issues pertaining to Africa. And um, it's important for me uh, in, in all of the new developments in Africa. Um, China has done a lot of investment in Africa, um, and the investment a lot of times is welcome because many other countries uh, refuse to invest in Africa. However, in exchange for the investments, uh, they get their natural resources taken. And Africa is, as a continent, has the most natural resources, but those natural resources are taken out of Africa. And so I, I think right now China has an opportunity to do something different and to not follow the same path as the Western colonial powers. Um, they can, instead of exploit, they can um, become a partner and work with Africa and develop their markets and, and build renewably because really um, the building right now that's happening in Africa is building in the industrial era and we're trying to move past the industrial area to the green era. And so um, with the new growth in the developing countries, they have to skip that stage. They have to skip, skip the stage of coal and fossil fuel because that is now the past. And they have to jump forward to the future, which is renewable energy. And it has to happen in a just, equitable manner. And so um, I'm, I, I hope that the future investment um, that of uh, both China and the U.S., is one in Africa is one that is more collaborative and one that represents the um, technology of the future. Thank you. Peter, would you say a few words? My name is Paul Wagoner. I'm from the Saanich Nation, Victoria, near Victoria, BC, southern tip of Vancouver Island. What I listened to today was a lot of solutions and a lot of great ideas on a very large scale. And these kind of ideas, we need them, and they, they must succeed. We have no choice, and they have to. All of us need to make this happen. But there are other things that need to happen. There are other stories and other beliefs of our people. And the idea of the inclusion of the first peoples of all the nations to be included inside of these discussions. They need to happen at the highest levels so that we can create unity and we can create something that's going to last into the future. And my thoughts are of education education of children, of how do we become a human being. Because our elders bestowed very strong and beautiful and, and precise ideas of how we live on this planet. How do we create a future for everybody? And so when I look at the colonial 
cultures, I see it missing. I see a great hole inside of those teachings. I was raised by my mother who was raised in the longhouse, but I also was raised inside of a school, a colonial school, public school, and not once did they talk about wisdom that I have. They did not once talk about a gift, and those things are important. We must teach the children of the, we have a word in the Lushutsi language of Chief Seattle and outlying tribes. It's called Hachusida, and that is the intellect of the heart, and that tells us that our entire being has intelligence and we must use it. So education is extremely important to me, and that's where I believe a very long-lasting future lies in instilling these ideas upon these children. Thank you. Deborah Parker of the Tulalip Tribe. Aesiam. Sitsayalta Sitsta. Haslahel. My indigenous name is Sitsayalta. That name goes seven generations back to my grandmother. It's a name that I carry with great pride and great honor. I come from the Tulalip tribes, a people who have been fighting for, for our environment for many years, for many generations. As I sat here this morning and listened to our speakers, I just want to thank our speakers and raise our hands to our speakers and each and every one of you in this room for being here today because it's each and every one of us that are here that want to learn, that want to grow and to change our society. We talk about our future, and I just want to uh, acknowledge that we have our future here. We have our indigenous youth here today, and I just would like to ask you please to stand. The Lummi Nation youth and family. Round of and applause, please. Thank you. I'd also like to ha ask my daughter, her traditional name is Halia, to please stand, Halia. This is my daughter. I brought her here today so that she can learn. Yes, she could be in her classrooms learning what's already been taught in the textbooks, but I think we need to go past that now. I think we need real solutions, and I'm glad my daughter is here to sing her songs, to speak from her heart, and to share with the world that indigenous peoples have a story to tell. And those stories are not in the textbook. They're not there. And I'm hoping her future generations that they will write, that they will speak, that they will stand in front of the world and express to the world how important our community is. And as I sat here, I, f I feel very sad in my heart because I used to go clam digging with my grandmother. And I thought, my daughter's here, and I have yet to take her clam digging. And the reason for that is the pollution that surrounds our reservations, that surrounds our lands. Industry has come in, and it's changed the way we live. So I'm ashamed on one part. But the happiness that comes inside of me is, is, is that I'm able to speak today, that I'm able to communicate with the world that we have a story to tell. And it's time we tell our story as indigenous peoples. And we, when we say we need to go to the high mark, to me, that's the high mark is where our indigenous peoples are. Being one with the land, being one with the earth is what our elders have always told us that we're no better than anyone else, and no one else is any better than us. And that's just a, a part of who we are as indigenous peoples. And I do hope and pray that we come together as a world and that we change these beliefs, this domination, destruction, rape of the earth, that we take care of one another. And these are not just my words, but these are words that have been handed down from generations. So once again, my name is Sitsayaltsa, and I come here with, with love and respect, and I ask that we work together as one and include our indigenous nations 
and each and every one of us from the north to the east to the south, that we come together as one. ACM, Tiguitzi, thank you. All right. I just want to say that, um, Freddie, please, would you speak? Siam and Estralicha. So he le conis and attacho tikai, Siam and Estralicha. So Caleb is my traditional name. My Christian name is Freddie Frederick Lane. I'm the 11th child of the late Vernon and Nancy Lane, both of Lummi. We first and foremost, on behalf of our delegation traveling here to the great city of Paris, and our elders and our, our chiefs send their most sincerest condolences to the families that have lost a loved one in, the, in this past week. And so we just wanted to convey that to, to any of our, our, our friends here in France and, and thank you for being resilient in, in your community and continuing in hosting the 20, 2015 World Conference on Climate Change. We, we bring a message to the people of the world from our elders, and our message is that the earth is alive. It's very important that we understand that if you look across this room, we recognize as red people the four colors of the earth, the four races, the, the, the black, the white, the yellow, and the red. We recognize that and honor that sacred relationship as human beings. And we come here to share this message that our rivers are alive, our mountains are alive, our ocean is alive. The way we express this is the four legged that walk the mountains and share those great mountains with each and every one of you. We are a salmon people and even our oceans have, beginning, have begun to rise in our traditional territories from Saanich to Tulela. And so we recognize that important relationship. We recognize that it's important for us to convey this message here on the world stage from our elders. If it wasn't for each and every one of you here today, and we thank you, Lawrence. We thank you. Thank you, Jill. We thank Deputy Director Sun Tzu for being here. Thank, thank each and every one of you for having this in your mind and in your heart to bring this very important message to the world. I applaud the United Nations for taking this stand and for each and every one of you bringing this message to your people, to your communities. This is who we are as, Slack, as Lactamish people. And, and we're here to let you know that there is a sacred relationship that we have as human beings. We have a sacred relationship with the land, with the air, with the water, and of course that great sacred fire which we carry you don't think about it every day, but that sun comes up and brings nourishment to you. You don't think about that clean water, but it nourishes your body. And, and, and so it is so important that we share, we're sharing our video on, on Thursday, and it's called The Earth is Alive. It's a very important message for, from our elders who couldn't be here, but they raise their hands to each and every one of you for, for taking this global stance. And, and again, we applaud the efforts here. I just want to acknowledge our camera people and, and everybody that had anything to do with this because it's such an important issue. Because once those rivers die, once those mountains are depleted of those glaciers, once the, the air in China is at a red alert, once these elements start to die, then we as human beings die. And so we are here just to share just this breadth of time with you to, to share this message. And again, Lawrence, we really thank you for all you thank do. You. Thank you. I'd like to um, thank our panelists. You know, in the technology solutions we're looking out here, we hear about permaculture. 
Permaculture comes from Native American indigenous tradition, permanent culture. The decisions made by the elders in the past always considered seven generations ahead, and that's the way our leaders should be making decisions. They should be learning from you. And I think now I'd like to bring someone here who cut short her expedition in the Amazon to be able to record the knowledge there that is still being kept in the depths of the Amazon. Celine Casto, the granddaughter of legendary explorer Jacques Casto, but she herself is a legend in her own right because she's bringing not only the expeditions to us, but the knowledge that will preserve our planet for the future. So Celine, will you please take the stage? And I'd like to ask also our indigenous youth to join us here, please. And Christine, would you join us on stage as well, please? Take a seat here. Christine, come in the middle here. Yes. Sit next to Paul on our right, Jill. Great, excellent. Celine. Our Belong Forum, Natalie, and uh, I think Marianne, who's been part of the Belong Forum, the creators of today's event, should also be here as well. Thank you. Oh, please. I love this. Um, thank you all for, for staying to this moment. Um, I will be briefer than I usually am to respect time. I think the fact that it's raining is actually a beautiful sign, so thank you for bringing the rain. It brings life. So let's not fight against the noise, but just embrace it. I begin with this photograph because for me it's very symbolic. I live at life at split level, which if you are a photographer or a cameraman, you understand. In the water, if you take a camera or your mask, right at the level of the water, you can see both below and above. It's a phenomenal perspective to keep in mind because you have to remember that everything on this planet is interconnected. And if you do not see all the parts for the whole picture, then you will always think that the planet is disconnected. So this, for me, is symbolic of that. What is above and below is one. And to understand what our human connection with that natural world is quintessential to our very survival. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey around the world. We've talked a lot in theory about our connection to the planet. It's important that we actually see it. This is a, a journey to Antarctica. I was. Uh, never dreaming of going to Antarctica. I don't particularly like the cold, but now that I have gone, I will keep going back. It is a place of complete magic. To be able to be in the presence of icebergs that have been here long before any generation of my family that I can remember is a privilege. To be close to these animals that allow you to come near them is an understanding of our connection to them no matter how close or far we are. And to challenge my own self and push my boundaries and my limitations in diving in negative two Celsius water and overcoming what was one of my worries and one of my fears, and that is to not be able to do this with a team of otherwise very large men <clears throat> and then me. But I did that and I overcame that fear because what is beneath the surface is always much more wondrous than the fear that stops us from going there. There is life. But there is also our history, our whaling history in Antarctica shows the past of human beings that did not understand. And that is part of our job here is to educate because we now know we have the privilege of access to these places and that privilege brings knowledge and knowledge is responsibility. Once you know, you then make a decision of what to do with that knowledge and that is your choice. And it should not be made on any kind of guilt, but rather on inspiration and love and understanding that we are just one part of a whole on this planet. This is another perhaps somewhat sad story of our current human history, ongoing now, the story of the high seas. You have fishing vessels that are permanent residents of the high seas where there is no governance, there is no government, there are no laws. So even if we are well-intentioned in choosing our seafood sustainably or we support human rights, if these vessels out at sea 
are unregulated and undocumented, how do we know how the people are treated? How do we know where our food comes from and our resources from our oceans if we cannot trace them? Because inevitably what happens with these vessels, they stay out at sea. Human rights abuses are common. These are the images that you see are the living conditions of these people that catch our food. But the fish is then transferred to another vessel and comes to port under a different flag and a different ship's name. And therefore, we cannot trace our food source back to the person that took it from the water. So if we do not have appropriate measures and systems in place to understand the full system of where we get our natural resources, then there is an ultimate flaw in our system, both in terms of our natural resources and our planet, but also in terms of our human species and how we choose to treat our own people. The Cori Calis Glacier, largest glacier coming off of the Calcaya ice cap in Peru in the Andes, the largest tropical ice cap we have on our planet. In 1991, it had already retreated 50 miles back, 50%, excuse me, of the glacier had already retreated back. When I was standing there, I felt very small. And let me tell you, that is a beautiful, wonderful feeling. It is a tremendous perspective to understand how magical and tremendous a place can be and how small we humans are in the shadow of that place. But we owe that place respect because we depend on it. I asked the glaciologist that we were working with at the time if he had hope that we would change in time to be able to stop the retreat of this glacier. And he said, Celine, unfortunately, human beings do not change until our back is against the wall. Well, we are here today to tell you that is now. Our backs are against the wall. We have no more choice. We are a people of privilege. We are here in Paris. We are talking about climate change. We are educated. And now we can take that education and pass it on. But it's also very important to remember the inspiration that nature brings to all of us, not just our sustenance, but the love that is in our hearts to be able to move forward. And that is an emotion we all have in common, no matter our political party, no matter our background, no matter our language or our nation. Emotion is something we all share. And to be able to swim with humpback whales, let me tell you, I, once more, you will have that incredible, magical feeling of being such a small being on the planet. To have a humpback whale look at you and acknowledge your presence makes you feel more alive than anything else. I had this privilege off the coast of Hawaii. We were filming humpback whales who were coming here to breed and to give birth to their calves a female, and allowed us to come close to her and her calf. And these were magical moments with the song of whales underneath the water. Through the hull of the boat going to sleep at night, we could hear the males singing their song. That is the most astounding lullaby you will ever hear. But then in other places, we have another witness to our human impact on our environment. Some of the footage you'll see here and I encourage you to go online. I, I won't play the whole video, but if you go online and look Scars of Freedom, you'll see that there's two sides to this story. There's the amazing capacity of human beings to act on our hope and our conviction that we can create change. But there is also the other side that we speak a lot about here at COP that is something that should fuel us not with anger, but with conviction that we can create change. This story is also about a fishing net and a young juvenile humpback whale that got caught in the fishing net. And luckily, we were filming not one kilometer from where she was. And mind you, this is about 500 kilometers offshore the coast of Chile. Not a lot of human beings out there. A couple of fishermen on the radio called out that a whale was caught in a net. We were between two dives, a camera team, and we said, we're on our way. None of us had any experience in freeing a whale from a fishing net. But that didn't stop us from trying because we were there and we were the ones to do this. My husband and I jumped in the water to film. We had two people cutting the net. And let me tell you, keeping up with a humpback whale is not easy. 
We were in and out of the water as she swam down to the depths. We'd have to come back up on the boat, wait till she surfaced, jump back in, and try to cut the net again. This is about 500 kilos of net that this humpback whale had been pulling. With sinkers and buoys, she wasn't able to feed herself. And the survival of the family pod meant that they had to abandon her and leave her behind. If we had not been there, she would have died. We finally were able to cut the net. There's a beautiful narrative that I encourage you to listen to when you see the video in its entirety. But the end is that change begins with the heart and that we are capable of that change and we are capable of just as much good as we are detriment. I'm gonna go fast forward. This is symbolic of the one sky we all live under, the one home that we share. The animals that share this planet with us have just as much right as we do. And this is my son a couple years ago. And my hope is that someday we are able to look with just as much love at this child as we are this child. And that we change the lens of our eye to see each individual person as an individual worth one life. That there is nothing greater than the well-being of those individual humans. And at the center of every environmental story, there's us. We are part of nature. We are not apart from nature. And if we stare long enough at any image, we will realize that that is a case across the board. So I encourage all of you to do everything that we can in our power that allows us to be worthy of calling this planet our home. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Thank you very much, uh, Jill. Everybody here, uh, Christine, uh, the um, First, America, um, First Nation who are represented here today. Uh, we'd also like to thank especially Belong Forum. Is uh, Natalie here? Is Marion here? Uh, because they are the ones who brought us together because we all belong on this planet. <laughs> Nowhere else. And uh, with this, we're, uh, our Belong Forum side event is adjourned. We thank all of you for being here. And uh, especially, I'd like to invite, we've been invited by La Galleria to view some of the technology innovation they have. And all of us will follow uh, Natalie and Marion in doing that. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much. <laughs>